introduce um, Dr. Matt Brock, MD. He's been using the equipment now for well over a year, um, if not heading into two. Um, it's wonderful now to have a team of medical doctors that are using the Equiscope as the go-to first. You know, for Dr. Delaney, every patient he sees now, the first thing he does with them is treat them with the Equiscope. And so to have, you know, five years of clinical documentation from Dr. Delaney of all these miracles after miracles after miracles, and to be able to give doctors new tools with new rules. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Matt Brock, who's uh, one of our wonderful medical doctors that's using our Equiscope, and he'll be sharing some of his case studies with you all today. So Dr. Matt Brock. Excellent. Thanks, John, for that introduction. I really appreciate that. And Angela, if you could go ahead and put the slideshow up there and I'll just start moving with it. Excellent. <clears throat> so hello, everybody. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I wanted to give you some clinical observations that I've made that have been uh, really good for patients in terms of outcomes when they weren't getting results in other situations, other, other practices, other modalities. So I labeled this pearls and cases with the electroequiscope with a focus on traumatic brain injury because I really want to focus on how we need to be looking more for head injuries in the, uh, in the in medical history of the patient when they come to us with a chronic illness. So I'm going to go through the issue with TBI and its connection with chronic illnesses. I'm going to give you an anatomical and physiological um, rationale for how you can use the electroequiscope and other, other things to help resolve uh, a traumatic brain injury. So let's go ahead and move to the next slide. All right, that's just uh, credentials for me. Um, as you can see, I, was, I went to medical school and, and uh, uh, long story short, I ended up getting sick and the only thing that got me well was integrated medicine, holistic care. So I ended up finding Dr. Lee Cowden along the way and, uh, and I've really partnered with him and, and uh, he's been my mentor since 2015. And uh, I am now part of the Academy of Comprehensive Integrated Medicine as well. And I'm also the International Educational Director uh, looking mostly at the Middle East. I've done work in um, Egypt and Israel and uh, Jordan teaching doctors integrated medicine. So looking at this, trying to make the connection between chronic illness and traumatic brain injury. So according to the CDC, there's 117 million Americans who suffer from quote unquote chronic illness. And so seven of the top 10 cases of death are reported to be chronic illness in 2014 and heart disease and cancer accounted for 46%. And so we look at this and should we realize how any injury to, to the head at any point in the patient's life can affect their health. And, and I'm gonna kind of get more into that so you can make this connection. But the brain, uh, as we know, is involved with the autonomic nervous system, which is the brain stem, the limbic system, the amygdala, the spinal cord, and that controls the parasympathetic and sympathetic. Well, what we know in the literature is that the autonomic nervous system is very intimately linked with the immunological system. So look at here, we got this rising incidence of uh, autoimmune diseases, multiple sclerosis. We have this rising incidence of neurodegenerative diseases. We have this rising incidence of allergies and eczema and this, this new thing that's coming up called mast cell degranulation syndrome. I would make the argument that there is, we need to be looking more at the brain because there's so many times I've seen patients who have been treated on the immunological level, for example, with mold toxicity, and they do well for a while, but then they end up relapsing because they're still stuck in sympathetic overdrive. All right, so the CDC's definition of a concussion um, is caused by a bump below or jolt to the head or by a hit to the body that causes the head and the brain to move rapidly back and forth. It's like the walnut and a shell analogy. 
So the sudden movement can cause the brain to bounce around or twist in the skull, creating chemical changes in the brain and sometimes stretching and damaging brain cells. Okay, CDC defines a, a TBI as a disruption of the normal function of the brain that can be caused by, again, a bump, blow, or jolt to the head or a penetrating injury. Everyone is at risk for a TBI, especially children and older adults, and I would say women as well. Uh, particularly people who have the APOE gene. Uh, well, I know that's very common in the mold world for people to be looking at for mold susceptibility. I'm also finding that to be susceptibility for uh, chronic issues from the traumatic brain injury. Now, looking at the Mayo Clinics, uh, they have, we talk about post-concussion syndrome as a complex disorder in which various symptoms, such as headaches and dizziness, last for weeks and sometimes months after the injury that caused the concussion. So these, CDC, Mayo Clinic, et cetera, these are supposed to be our leading forefront leaders in medicine and, and West, in the Western world and in America. But what you'll find is when you get patients who have on-the-job traumatic brain injuries or have been brain injured and go see the world-renowned neurologist, they're not getting results because there's no clear uh, modality in the allopathic world to approach a head injury because they just don't have the tools, they don't have the understanding. It, it's a very dynamic disease process that requires multiple things. All right, like I said, it's a problem, guys. We need, guys, if you take anything away from this talk, when you get a new patient in and they come in for whatever it is, uh, chronic migraines, neurodegenerative diseases, autoimmune diseases, uh, or clearly just come into you because they've had a TBI and they're not getting results, you need to screen in your history. Have you ever fallen down the stairs? Have you ever fall down a ladder? Did you ever play football or soccer? Right? When you were when you were one years old, did your mom drop you off the table and she was changed your diaper? You got to ask these questions because they won't tell you. All right. So look at the CDC. Three TBIs every, occur every minute. 5.3 million live with disability from TBI. 76 billion in medical care, rehab, and lost work. And this was in the Journal of Neur Neurotrauma in 2014. Next slide. One thing, we're going to start looking at the different breakdowns of treating a traumatic brain injury. And, then, and as promised, we will get into the protocols for the electroequoscope and how to deal with this, understanding the anatomy, understanding the physiology. Okay, so pathophysiology. So the cerebral spinal fluid, as you could see here on this, on this picture, uh, has a flow system. You know, it's produced in these little plexi and, and that are in the ventricles of the brain. Okay, you can see lateral ventricle, third ventricle, fourth ventricle. They're these fluid-filled sacs in the brain, and they have these choroid plexuses, and these produce cerebral spinal fluid. Well, that allows the brain to essentially float in this medium in the skull that's, that's divided by certain layers of the brain, like the dura. Okay, and this cerebral spinal flow drains metabolic waste. It's involved in the acid-base balance. It's involved in the nutritional support for the brain. It drains metabolic waste, okay? It provides protection for the brain. So the dynamic interaction of the cerebral spinal fluid, it's uh, the dura connection to the skull, and uh, how the skull plates are moving is really important when we're talking about somebody who's had any sort of significant head injury. All right, next slide. Here's another anatomical concept that's really important to understand, is the dura that wraps around the brain, extends down the spinal cord all the way down to the tailbone here, down to the sacrum, okay? And so there's key attachments on the spinal cord at C2, the, cer the cervical level of C2. If you ever look at a C2 on an x-ray, it's the biggest vertebra in the neck because it's got a ton of uh, muscle attachments. And it also is a place where the dura on the brain attaches. And then we go down to the tailbone and the sacrum, there's another dural attachment, okay? I want you to keep this in your, in your mind, uh, like a penguin on an iceberg, okay? Keep that penguin on the iceberg. Don't let it fall off because that's going to help you for your placement of your plates when you're going through your protocols of your traumatic brain injury patients with the electroequoscope. All right, next slide. There we go. Perfect. All right, just a reminder. Yeah, there's a, here's a concept of diffuse axonal injury, DAI, okay? 
So you have here, uh, looks like a like a like a preteen boy here. He struck his head, and there's a there's a forward motion. Then there's the then there's the energy that travels backwards, and you can see between the gray matter and the white matter there is a shearing. Okay, there is an axonal disruption. Okay, and you, this is part of the pathophysiology here. So when I talk to patients who have traumatic brain injury, uh, you will if you do any um, heart rate variability testing or any sort of testing that picks up where they're at in their autonomic nervous system, almost invariably you will find these patients are stuck in sympathetic overdrive. It's because the brain after one of these disputes axonal injuries is stuck in a guarded state. It hasn't healed from this injury. And so it's in a kind of flight, a low grade fight or flight response, which ends up going to the whole body. So we talked about shear injury. Um, I just wanted to give you some studies here to support what I'm telling you. I talked about PET studies. There's 10 BI patients who demonstrated persistent thalamic inflammation that had been demonstrated. Okay, get this, is, hear this guys, 17 years out from the injury. So when, when people look at you cross-eyed and you say, well, maybe that injury you had 20 years ago in the motocross race where you got knocked out might be having something to do with why you're having digestive problems, why you can't heal a chronic sacroiliac joint dysfunction or arthritic joint, um, why you're going autoimmune, um, why you're having insomnia, why you're having mineral wasting syndrome. They, you'll tell, you can give them the study here and saying, well, there's persistent inflammation noted on, on uh, these are metabolic imaging studies, PET studies, showing inflammation in the thalamus. And the thalamus is a key area because that's like the symphony orchestrator of the brain. It receives all the sensory input from the brainstem and from the senses of the body. Then it goes up to the upper brain and the thalamus is involved in orchestrating it to the upper brain where it needs to go. So if you get those disruptions, there's, there's imbalances in the brain, which creates that uh, fight or flight chronic stuck state or sympathetic, um, um, dis excuse me, sympathetic dysfunction. So again, more studies. Looking at a rat study, eight to 10 weeks post-trauma showed continued neurosensory and cognitive defects, eight to 10 weeks out from the trauma. So um, we need to understand that it, head injuries that are unresolved, untreated, can go on with inflammation and dysfunction for years after the injury. Next slide. Here, and this is what I was just explaining to you, everybody, the thalamocortical path. Now, if you say that to your patient, they'll really feel like they're getting their money's worth because it's a really fancy word, but really all it is, it's just the gatekeeper of the brain. And it really, it's showing you here that, that the thalamus is the key orchestrator for all the sensory input you're getting from the midbrain and if those, thal those thalamocortical pathways are disrupted from a brain injury, the patient will get, be, be getting too much information in one part of the cerebral cortex while getting hardly any on another part of the cerebral cortex, which creates a stress state in the brain. And if the brain is in the stress state, then the entire body is going to be in a stress state. Uh, more, more to this. Now, I've mentioned this already a few times, this word dysautonomia or... or um, autonomic dysfunction. It's just talking about the autonomic nervous system is not balanced properly. Um, so it refers, uh, here's the official definition here. It refers to a disorder of the autonomic nervous system function that generally involves failure of the sympathetic or parasympathetic, so fight or flight, sympathetic or parasympathetic, rest and digest components of the ANS. But dysautonomia involving excess or overactive ANS actions also can occur. This is from the National Institute of Health. So as I mentioned here before, and here's a study reference, they're very common after TBIs and concussions. And here's the, the consensus here that I stated below. Okay. okay, so just looking at the impact of the uh, systemically over the whole body, okay? The brain, here you get brain fog, migraines, vertigo, fainting, lightheadedness. You can see the heart, you're gonna have bradycardia, tachycardia, patients will experience butterflies or palpitations or chest pain, stomach, they can begin to uh, develop leaky gut or gut breakdown or, or um, dyspepsia. Well, why? Well, because if you're in autonomic overdrive, the nerves that are going to your adrenal glands are telling the adrenal to make adrenaline, they're telling them to make cortisol. 
Well, cortisol at short periods of time is good, but if you're constantly making cortisol, eventually you will start wearing down your adrenals. And the cortisol actually has been shown over, if it's constantly being secreted, that it will wear down the lining of the gut. Okay, so it's not uncommon to have a patient who's had a chronic head injury to have stomach issues and leaky gut, which we know leaky gut can lead to immune dysfunction and more brain inflammation. It's like this vicious cycle. Um, the mouth, obviously, with the wearing down of the gums and tooth decay, uh, blood vessels with hypertension and, and poor perfusion because the autonomic nervous system really affects the tone dilation or, base, or, or constriction of the blood vessels. Uh, the motility of the intestines, whether they're getting constipation and diarrhea. There's also them, some things that I've seen with head injury that I've seen with functional neurologists that the ileocecal valve and the vagus nerve connection with small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, SIBO. Okay, so if there's been a head injury and the vagus nerve's dysfunctioning, the ileocecal valve may be dysfunctioning, which is causing reflux of certain bacteria into the small bowel that shouldn't happen, which creates a SIBO problem, okay? Uh, dry eye, you can see the rest of these things. Bladder, you know, all these things, okay? Oh, sorry for that picture being a little cut off there. No, I want, I want you guys to take this one to the bank as well, because when you begin to treat people with the electroequiscope, what you want to do when they're not in your office, or if you have the ability to do intravenous therapy, you need to understand that most, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say it, 95 to 100% of these patients have severely low total body magnesium, potassium, zinc, selenium, all the minerals, okay? And you have to understand that one of the most important minerals when we're talking about heart function and brain function is magnesium. And don't have, don't and if the patient comes in with labs and they say, well, my magnesium level is normal, you can basically go ahead and tell them, well, that doesn't mean anything. Because when they test the blood, they're looking at the serum magnesium. But what you want to know is if you look at the distribution of minerals in the serum versus in the cell, we know that potassium and magnesium are primarily stored in the cell. So if you're getting a serum test for magnesium, you're not really getting a picture of the total body magnesium. So you can just take that serum test and throw it out the window. And I've treated plenty of patients who have a normal magnesium level with tons of magnesium, and I see improvement. Okay, so this is a study that was done in Japan. Uh, I don't know if this is the one or not, but no, this is an ICU study. So they found just within six hours after the injury, their magnesium was significantly lower. So there is a mineral wasting state that can immediately occur with a traumatic brain injury. And I've also found this to be persistent with chronic injury. Okay, so no, you need to be aggressive about mineral replacement. And I'll demonstrate how I did this with a case at the end here. Next slide. For post concussive syndrome, I'm just showing you the non specificity of the symptoms, guys. You're going to have to ask specifically either, either the spouse, the mom, the dad, or the partner, whoever is there with the patient to go, you know, has this person had a history of head injury? Because a lot of times they won't tell you and their symptoms are so nonspecific. All they, all they know is I'm sick, I don't feel well, what can you do for me? So like you said, sleep, sleep problems, headaches, psychological problems, cognitive with memory, concentration. Think, you can see like this could be a slew of things, okay? All right, next slide. So here is the mainstream standard of care allopathic treatment for uh, a traumatic brain injury. Rest, pain medications, antidepressants, Psychotherapy, cognitive therapy, relaxation. Hmm. Well, I just showed you all the pathological, pathophysiological and anatomical issues, and I don't see any of these addressing any of those issues. So we need answers, and this right now is not sufficient. I mean, we have NFL players committing suicide, and I know John has worked with some, some professional athletes, who so this is a big problem. Okay, and so we need to do better with this. Real quick, I'm not going to get much into this, um, diagnostics. If you ever get involved in a case like a workers' comp or a court case where they want to know what are you leaning on in terms of a diagnosis, because this can get slippery in a, in a court situation. So what I would highly recommend to everybody is a lot of times CT and MRI scans are going to be normal. 
And because they have actually demonstrated in studies that the specificity and sensitivity is really low for catching diffuse axonal injury and any kind of weird dysfunction. I mean, that has to be something like a huge brain bleed in order to pick it up. But what you will find, even if it's months to years, is a nuclear PET scan. Okay, the nuclear PET scan has been clearly shown. I think I did. I think I did post a study. Uh, we can talk about that here in a second. Hold that. Hold that thought. Uh, physical exam, uh, corticometric brain gauge. Uh, you can, I won't talk about that. But if you guys want to email me questions about that, I'm happy to talk to you about it. And, and find a good functional neurologist. They, they can find some things that we can't unless you've been specifically trained in this, particularly when patients are having really bad instability and gait problems and, and vertigo. You really want to might have them get function, get, excuse me, get evaluated by a functional neurologist because they have some great tools and uh, therapy to help that part of it. Okay, next. this is a study I wanted to show you with the nuclear PET spec scan. And it was crazy is this, this isn't really the standard of care if you want to actually diagnose a traumatic brain injury. Is there's 19 longitudinal and 52 cross-sectional studies. So it's like a meta-analysis. And they looked at all of them and they looked at mild, moderate, severe TBI. Um, they found they found that the lesions not detected on MRI and CT were actually could be found on a PET scan, and it had a a hundred percent negative predictive value, and it's considered considered level two A evidence. So now you have potentially have a tool if the patient you know seeing is believing, or you're in a court case or or, or a workers comp. This is one way you can kind of put this issue to bed in terms of this TBI an issue and is it contributing to the patient's symptomology. Next slide. So strategy, let's talk about strategy for treating TBI patients with microcurrent therapy, the electroecroscope, and integrative medicine. All right. I mentioned to you about the skull dynamics. They they ought of times, guys, they have a jammed skull. Now, unfortunately, I didn't put a picture of a skull on here, but if you ever looked at a picture of a skull and all the bones, it looks like a puzzle. I mean, they, they're coming together in all different ways. And so what you need to do, and, and in the academy and conference uh, with Dr. Lee Cowden and the videos and stuff, you can learn how to unjam a skull. Um, I have seen some cranial sacrotherapists do a good job of this. Some chiropractors have no understand how to do this. This is just the way I know how to do it. And unfortunately, I can't really get into that right now because this talk is supposed to be focused on microcurrent therapy. But you want to have a way to getting their skull dynamics moving again. Because if you don't, you're going to start detoxifying them. The brain is going to start extruding toxins. And then those toxins are going to get trapped because their skull isn't moving properly. And they're going to not feel well. They're going to get headache. They're going to get brain fog. Okay, so it's really important that you get the skull moving. And if you don't know how to do it, uh, we can get you hooked up with, uh, with the video on the Academy of Conference of Your Medicine. Uh, we can get yourself involved with a cranial sacral therapist or a chiropractor who knows skull work or an osteopath. Okay. Replace minerals, guys. Now I'm talking that they have normal kidney function. You're safe to go because the worst thing can happen with magnesium if they have normal kidneys. I'm talking about oral administration is diarrhea. So you want to give them magnesium twice a day, oftentimes orally to bowel tolerance. Uh, give them potassium a couple times a day. And again, be very careful with potassium and make sure they have normal kidney function. If they have normal kidney function, it's pretty safe. But if they don't, you need to be really careful. Uh, fulvic minerals. I like Energy Boost 70 Morningstar fulvic minerals that just get a general mineral replacement. Uh, get them, get, I think it's a good idea to give them about 200 micrograms of selenium and about 30 to 60 milligrams of zinc. Okay. Now, if they have the dizziness or instability, you're going to want to get a teammate involved, a good functional neurologist who can help the ear issue with the eye. Okay, because unfortunately the electroecoscope doesn't quite approach, can't quite get that. You actually need therapy to fix that part of the brain injury. Guys, these guys, these patients have terrible adrenal function. You must put them on adrenal support. Okay, uh, microcurrent therapy is awesome for getting the autonomic nervous system to chill out, and it's awesome for stimulating deep parts of the limbic system, and it's awesome for getting the thalamocortical pathways reconnected. It's a great tool if you do the stimulations in the right place at the right time. And we're going to talk about that with a case. And guys, while you have them pinned down on the electroscope for one to three, four, however long you're doing it, you got to, you know, once you get that relationship with the patient, you got to work through the emotions, guys. 
you got to work with the emotional blocks of healing. And I'll give you an example of this with one of my cases here. Uh, regenerative mushrooms. Uh, lion's mane is one that I like to use. Use. Make sure the source of lion's mane that you're using is grown off of wood. It has a lot of mushroom extracts that like to grow off rice. So use lion's mane. I use about three grams a day, uh, typically before meals, and it's a great neuroregenerator. And you want to be brain building and anti-inflammatory fats. And those could be like um, um, the lipid soluble flavonoids like astaxanthin and lutein. Uh, you want to do omega-3 fish oil that ha that makes sure it has low mercury. You know, for example, uh, Nordic Natural Nordic Naturals is a great product. They do a good, good job there. I think Carlson is decent in terms of brain building omegas. And phosphatidylcholine is a nice one as well. Phosphatidylserine, so forth. These are great fats that help build back the brain, quench the inflammation, and they're lipid soluble because you got to do lipid soluble things to get into the brain. Yeah, right about in there. That's about where that's about where C two is. That big one, that 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 second, so yeah, that that big that one right there. That's just one little bit lower, Angela. You know, just a little bit that one right there. That C two, okay, to the right and to the left of that big knuckle, which is the spinous process. You're going to want to put a plate on each side. And then Angela, go all the way down to the pelvis, the sacrum area, and you're gonna to the right and to the left, about in that region, you're gonna to wanna to put a plate to the right and a plate to the left. So you're gonna have four plates total. And what you're doing is you're stimulating those areas where the dura connect, connects. Well, the dura, there, I don't quite understand this, but we have an anatomic uh, rationale for doing this, is when you stimulate the electroequiscope at the different frequencies with these stimulation points, it helps reset the autonomic nervous system. It helps reset that neural connection with the sacrum, the cervical spine, and the skull. Okay, and I see great things happen. I've seen, I see range of motion with the neck improve 30, 40 degrees just after the treatment. I see the auto, I can literally feel the patient switched into parasympathetic mode with this. So this is super important. Now guys, shame on me because I treated a lot of patients with traumatic brain injury and I didn't start, I didn't start using the auricular protocols that the Thorps give us until recently. And I was kicking the reason I'd say shame on me because man, I see some amazing results with brain patients with the simulation points. My goodness. I mean, what, what there is, there's seven, there's seven points on the uh, Thorpe electroequiscope um, manual with our protocols that they have you stimulate to start out the protocol. But then what you can do is you can stimulate uh, specific areas where the, where the patient's having a problem. Now the patient I'm going to show you, uh, she had a problem with her skull and headaches and she had bad autonomic dysfunction. So if you look at the labels on this, on this picture, it says subcortex, it says occiput and brainstem, and you can follow those arrows to the point at the simulation on the ear. They're the little red dots on the inner on the inner uh, crest of the ear. Now, when you stimulate those points, uh, you can get some magnificent results, some magnificent detox, some magnificent blood flow and regulation back to those areas in the brain by stimulating the ear. Now, one concept you might be able to hang on with this is one, it's traditional Chinese medicine, and they knew what they're, knew what they're doing because they've been around like over a thousand years. And, and two, if you ever looked at an ear, it's almost like an upside down fetus. So theoretically, what might be going on is when you stimulate these points, it's almost like a map where you're stimulating really deep parts in the autonomic nervous system. So you're getting the areas that you can't get to otherwise. The Thorps have the TMJ protocol and it's classically used to treat, <clears throat> excuse me, TMJ. And they already have a study published and I've seen this clinically, it works really good for TMJ. But what I've also found is it works good for part of your protocol for traumatic brain injury. And so the reason that is, is if you look at the nerve, the major cranial nerves that are right where the protocol is treating, it's the trigeminal nerve, which is a huge nerve that goes to the face and the facial nerve. Well, these nerves travel back to the brainstem and the neck, which this picture is not showing. And they really give you another stimulation point to reset the brainstem, which is a major autonomic nervous system center. Okay. 
So you can use that as another stimulation point to help uh, the brain reset in terms of getting more parasympathetic. I, do, I basically just said this on the other slide. It's just another way of looking at it. You can see that, that white stuff in the skull that's open. That's the dura, okay? And that's, and that's how it's dividing the brain. Well, that white substance, which is the dura, extends down to the cervical spine. It covers the spinal cord and attaches at the C2 cervical spine and the sacrum. And you can see how it's almost like a fibrous network where you can get stimulation to, to hit the nervous system in a different way. So that's just another way of looking at that. Uh, I call it neurosensory integration. Here, this is another protocol that I've used. So what you can do on your protocol is you can ground the patient with foot plates and you can do the trigger probe on the fingertips. And then you can ground the patient with holding the, um, uh, the bars uh, on their hands and then you can do their toes. Because if you look here at the reflexology map, uh, the fingertips and the thumb tips and the toe tips are major stimulation points for the brain. And they are stimulating different parts of the brain. So you're getting different stimulation points. And I have seen this clinically where I've treated a patient, um, I've treated the patient with all those different protocols I presented to you. And there wasn't really a robust switch in their autonomic nervous system. Then I start treating this part and oh my goodness, like the, the breakthrough comes forth and they actually start detoxifying right in front of you. And then they actually get a little panic because they flip into their, their, their relaxed state because they've never been, they haven't been there in years. And so all this, and people, don't be surprised when people panic a little bit when they go parasympathetic, which is rest, because they haven't been there in years and they don't know what that feels like. So you just can comfort them and assure them. And it's good to have some detox remedies on hand while you're doing this therapy that will help them help them through detoxification. So, um, uh, Angela, can you go back a few slides? And I'll tell you when to stop. I was thinking of the dura on this particular slide, but what I was really thinking of is, Angela, will you point right where the spine meets the skull right in the center? Up a little bit more. Up a little bit more. Right about there. If you put a plate right in the center, right there, that's about the C1 cervical vertebra, and then you go straight down to the sacrum, Angela, and then you put a plate right in the center, right in the center, right there, and then you have the ear clips on for this particular protocol. So I, I labeled there C1 and sacrum and ear clips. I'm sorry, guys, I misspoke that. So that is a great autonomic reset stimulation point. I've seen it over and over and over again. You stimulate C1 with a plate right in the middle. You stimulate sacrum right in the middle with a plate with the ear clips on. And you're running, just so you guys know, you're running 0.5 cycles per second, 2.5, 5, 8, and 10. You don't want to typically do any more than that when you're doing brain protocols because it can put into a stress state. And you, I typically run them about 10 to 15 minutes each cycle just to get that stimulation on that particular protocol. So I just want to make sure you guys understand that. That's typically the one I start with too when I'm doing a brain protocol. Next, then the ear one is typically the next one I do. Then the TMJ would be the next one. Then the last one I do is the Dura attachments. Okay? All right, keep going. Thanks. I just had this case. It's fresh, guys. So it's, it's a cool case. It's fresh and it was a great outcome. And it really brings in the power of the microcurrent therapy, the power of a holistic integrated medicine approach and how they all work so beautifully together. Uh, like John says, man, we need new, new rules, new rules, new tools, new tools, new rules, okay? So uh, I'm gonna give you the history here. It's a, a beautiful young lady. She's 23 years old. Um, she was a cheerleader eight years ago. And uh, I, I don't think many of us appreciate what the risk these girls put themselves, but she fell 12 feet and hit the back of her head, okay? And she had no loss of consciousness. And she went to the doctor and basically said, do you have a concussion? Just, you know, do what I told you before, what was the Main Street arrest, relaxation, psychotherapy, anti-inflammatories, yada, yada, yada. She's not getting better. She's getting worse. She's got terrible headache, pain, um, brain fog, and so forth. And she's got terrible neck pain. I mean, she lost nearly uh, 40 degrees of neck rotation on both sides, but it was worse on the right. And she has terrible trapezius tightness. Um, more into the history, she's got eyelid twitching, muscle tightness, and occasional cramps. I'll explain that. 
I'll just explain it now. Eyelid twitching is called blepharospasm. It's a telltale sign for potassium deficiency. Okay, that's just a pearl for you. Eyelid twitching is blepharospasm, which is often related to potassium deficiency. Okay, and muscle tightness is typically pointing at magnesium deficiency. With cramps, is almost telltale magnesium deficiency. Uh, she has some mild uh, short-term recall memory issues. Uh, she's got jumbled speech at times. Uh, she's developing hypersensitivities to food. Now that should start making you think, okay, there's the autonomic nervous system and the immune system connection. Now the immune system is going haywire. One of the first signs of that is food hypersensitivities. Then you're going to get environmental hypersensitivities and so forth. Okay. Uh, she gets a lightheadedness and gets quote unquote low blood sugar symptoms. Okay. That is to me when patients stand up and they get kind of that lightheaded feeling and they feel like low blood pressure or low blood sugar, that is adrenal dysfunction. Constipation, there you go with vagal nerve dysfunction. Okay. So the, just to, she was seen by one of the top two neurologists in this region. And they basically, what, what ended up happening guys, is they told her that she was crazy and there was nothing wrong with her. And that she was just getting attention from this. And so it was a terrible situation. Uh, she'd seen many physicians. The only thing that really gave her any comfort was chiropractic care that she continued to do, uh, but but things would tend to relapse back. So she'd have to see the chiropractor two or three times a week. Um, so uh, like I say here, she's got a lot. So when she's coming to see me, she's got a lot of doubt, a lot of apprehension, a lot of unbelief, a lot of hopelessness. That right there is an emotional, spiritual block of healing that you need to recognize and address, okay? Just some more history just to just to fill it up for everyone. Uh, Fast medical, TBI, she has insomnia, polyps in the colon, eczema on the legs. And this is, I want you guys to look at this, tachycardia, okay? And we'll get into the exam and what that looks like. Had all four of her wisdom teeth removed is something to keep in mind. Sometimes a wisdom tooth extraction sites can be a toxic focus, meaning they can get, um, they don't pull out the periodontal ligament and they can get a chronic low-grade infection down in the bone that could be addressed. So that's something to think about. Uh, she has no more free amalgams or root canals. Uh, she takes Benadryl for sleep. Uh, not a good plan. Uh, takes, uh, she has allergies to ibuprofen and non-steroidals. Uh, she's only been able to complete two years of college because she's basically living like a disabled person. I mean, she can't hardly do anything. Uh, she has no job, uh, has no source of income. Uh, she has a boyfriend. She has a supportive family. Um, uh, her family history, grandfather had type 2 diabetes. Her diet is, there's no really restrictions there. <laughs> Look at this heart rate. I have a 23-year-old girl who on the outside looks pretty healthy, but we all know she ain't healthy. Um, her heart rate, when I check her vitals, is 130 beats per minute. And that's, she says, oh, that's where I normally am. And I go, that is not normal. I don't care who you are. I mean, that, that you can eventually get heart failure if your heart is beating 130 beats per minute all the time because your heart will just eventually get what's called a, uh, a tachycardiomyopathy, which is just a fancy way of saying the, heart's, it, the heart is restructuring around this fast heart rate and eventually it becomes inefficient and you go into heart failure. But if you look here on gross physical exam, her cranial nerves are fine. Her extraocular movements uh, are intact. Uh, so she doesn't have any vestibular dysfunction or, or ocular dysfunction. So I don't think she's going to need a functional neurologist to help me. She's got terrible tightness in the neck, terrible rotational issues in the neck and her traps. Her reflexes are normal. Um, She's had, no, this is about the heart rate. She's had a workup for her heart, for her regular doctor. They had a stress test and EKG and found it was just a, just a fast heart rate called tachycardia. And they had no etiology and said, well, that's just, that's, we have no other answer for you. So here's my diagnosis on the left here. Uh, TBI with mineral wasting, chronic. How do I know that? Well, she's got muscle tightness. She's got blepharospasm. She's got a heart rate of 130 Okay, one of the most avid organs for magnesium is your heart, okay? And so well, I will give you, I'll prove it to you on this case. Uh, adrenal fatigue, we know about the low blood sugar. Uh, people, people also just have notes and they talk about frequent urination at night and throughout the day. Like they said, they drink a ton of water, but it goes right through them. That's typically an adrenal fatigue sign. Uh, they have salt cravings. Uh, they get dizzy when they stand up uh, and so forth. Uh, skull dysfunction or skull jamming. 
a neural connection mismatch of the server code sacrum, an autonomic dysfunction, neurogenic inflammation, and on the emotional, spiritual level, hopelessness, doubt, and unbelief. Okay, so look at how we can all of a sudden we have all these words of a diagnosis that we can actually do something for versus giving somebody one diagnosis and telling them there's nothing wrong with them. So this is what's empowering for not only the doctor, but for the patient. What do we do here? This is, so she came to see me. She was from out of town. She's from the Seattle area and I'm, I'm about three and a half hours. I'm more near the Portland area. And um, she came down to see me. And one of the first things I did for her is I hooked her up to an IV and I did a magnesium IV push. I'm going to put a word of caution out to you. If you've never done a magnesium IV push, you need to go spend some time with Dr. Jonathan Wright at Tahoma Clinic because you cannot hook somebody up to an IV and push magnesium really fast because you can really get in trouble. You can really hurt somebody. So you need to understand how to do that. It needs to be done very, very slowly. Um, and so basically I gave her uh, on the order of three to six grams of magnesium every day I saw her in the beginning of treatment because your total body magnesium guys you will be impressed how depleted you can get in magnesium for somebody like this with this history and this story so I started out with three to six grams of a magnesium IV push which typically would take me anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour depending on how much I'm giving her and um I, I would work on her skull with this jam, unjamming of the skull, um, getting the skull plates moving again. I, I, it's not any rapid adjustment. It's not any, anything that requires chiropractic training. It's just basically pushing on the skull plates in a particular order that gets everything moving again. I would start that as well. I would do that every day. And then we get to hook her up to the electroscope. The first protocol I would do was the plate at C1 in the middle the plate of the sacrum and the ear clips. And we would run that for about an hour, about 15 minutes or 10 minutes per cycle uh, from 0 0.5, 2.5, 5, 8, and 10 cycles per second or frequency. Okay, then I would do the TMJ protocol, you know, on mode one and mode two and as the, out, as the protocol outlines. And then I got excited about this. I, on the second or third day, I began to use the auricular protocol. And guys, as I was standing next to her doing the protocol, you would literally feel her, just everything just let go on her body. You would just feel the, the nervous system switch over into parasympathetic. And the patient would say, my goodness, what is going on? I just feel like I want to take a nap all of a sudden. And um, I would stimulate the, um, I think I wrote it down here. Yeah, the seven masked points of well-being, uh, which is like the sympathetic, the shin men, uh, the adrenal point, the muscle point. You, know, you guys can look at that ear outline to know where to stimulate those points. And then I would focus on the occiput and brainstem stimulation points as well. And guys, on one of the treatments during this session, she began to have an emotional breakdown. Okay, then we had to, then I actually had to stop it for a second and we worked with that emotion and it released. So here's a crazy concept. I've seen this multiple times, this clinical observation. Guys, when you're hitting the right target, uh, sometimes there's, uh, some people refer to them as trapped emotions. This is like more of an emotional, spiritual concept. Homeopathically, you, you, you can, they understand this concept. So I began to stimulate those deep areas in the brain where there may be an emotion and it would begin to release. And so she had great emotional releases with the auricular protocols and with huge detox, which is, is a good thing because when you, stimulate areas that haven't been stimulated and you're getting blood flow, you're getting uh, ATP to the nerves so they can actually start detoxifying and creating energy and doing and metabolizing and the things they haven't been doing properly for years. Now you're going to get detox. Now you're going to get emotional release. Now you're going to get blood flow. Now you're going to get air. Now you're going to get balance on the brain. And that is going to give you sympathetic resonance. That's going to give you autonomic parasympathetic sympathetic sway. Okay, so I strongly encourage you to do the auricular protocols for your traumatic brain injury patients. Now, the caveat to this is it's not fun. It's the only protocol that hurts. It's like a piercing, okay? But just prep the patient for it, give them an understanding of it, and just tell them it's worth it if you can hang in there. But remember, they're always in charge. Don't force it on them. And then I did the neck and the sacrum on both sides for the dura connections. And then guys, we work through the emotions. Why you have them pinned down on all these and doing all these protocols. 
And one of the emotions we really had to work through was the unbelief and the disappointments from all the doctors who had seen her, who basically told her, you're not going to get better. This is the way you're going to be. This is your problem. You're lying. So we worked through those things. You know, we gave her hope. We said, no, you can get better. You know, we give her the, te- give her your testimonies where you've seen other patients get better, you know, and, and, and people on a spiritual level, they, they need to know the creator wants them to be healed. Okay. There's sometimes people, uh, get yoked into religiosity and they and they think that this is God's punishment or something and you need to clearly say that's a stink that's a stinking thinking because uh, if you know the creator he definitely wants you to be healed <laughs> so we worked through those things and she was able to do forgiveness forgiveness is unforgiveness is a huge block of healing and the big people she had to forgive was people who had hurt her in high school and the doctors who had told her there was nothing wrong with her and she was faking you had to go through forgiveness of that and um, like you can see here i would after i'd actually do the magnesium pushes and the iv we would also give it to her orally twice a day with all these other minerals potassium selenium zinc and the fulvic minerals and i'd actually have her soak in epsom salts as well because Epsom salts uh, is magnesium sulfate that will absorb to the skin, and you can actually uh, get more magnesium in there. Yeah, we get more magnesium in there. All right, B complex is important. Fish oil, adrenal support. You guys can read all this later. Uh, one thing, one caveat I want you guys to know is uh, you need to have some sort of quick detox remedy on hand when you're working with Equiscope. And one thing I really liked with Nutramedics is the Berber Panella. That works really go out, it works really fast and you just basically give about 15 20 drops you can give it every 15 minutes if you need to and the brain fog will clear the pain will clear uh, whatever detox response they're having so the outcome so in five days of treatment she got way she got eight way more improvement than eight years of seeing multiple doctors she um she had pain her pain in her head that was constant she was having periods of clarity and no pain. And so when you give somebody a little bit of hope, that in itself is a healing. And that brings faith, that brings hope, that brings love, that these things heal. And then uh, she got, she was, I got her off the uh, Dura protocol and she went to the bathroom and she accidentally turned her neck and she almost touched her shoulder with her chin. And she came back in the room and and was crying, saying, I haven't been able to turn my neck like this in almost eight years. She was crying with joy. Her muscles were loosening. Her periods, she was having periods of like the sleepiness where I would just be treating her and she would just be there with a small grin on her face, uh, just resting. She goes, I just feel like I need to go to sleep because she hadn't been, she hadn't felt that way in years. And she left there were were other doctors and, and treatments being apprehensive and uh, skeptical. She left my office after those five days saying, I'm going to be okay. And so that's the power of hope. That's the power of forgiveness. That's the power of going from unbelief to believing. So I hope that was helpful for y'all. Uh, I mean, I really love the equiscope and treating traumatic brain injury patients and patients who have hypersensitivities. Uh, I love I love the equiscope for so many things, and it's a beautiful tool and the technology that it does. Uh, new rules, new tools like John will tell you, but it also you get to pin down the patient. You know, once you develop a relationship, you can really work on the emotional, spiritual pieces, which is, which is a huge piece to getting somebody over a chronic illness. So, uh, I thank you all. Enjoyed this. Uh, have a blessed evening. Questions? You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, I have a question. I was just wondering what. Do you use the um, mode two or just mode one of the AccuScope when you're when you're you know doing yeah. these like dural yeah attachments yeah. and stuff? Yeah, uh, good question, Ricky. Is that, that's what you go by, Ricky? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, it depends. Uh, if I have if I have the ear clips on, you know, I have them on the C ones uh, sacrum, like uh-huh. the first protocol. I just do mode one. Uh, with the TMJ protocol, I follow the book, and there's mode one and mode two. Okay. Um, with the Dura, I just do mode one. Okay. Um, good question. Thank you. Um, with the auriculars, I just do, they yeah, basically on the protocol, they just have you doing the eight cycles per second simulations. Yeah. And yeah. that works just fine. I haven't found the need to tweak that at all. Cool. Cool. That's what I was 
wondering. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. The auricular? Yeah, the auricular, uh, doing the eight cycles per second. If you have a patient that's not tolerating it well, drop to 2.5. And okay. They'll tolerate a little better, you know, if you drop it down and then slowly bring them, you know, bring them up. And you can take it down to 2.5. And 2.5 is a good frequency for those that are not tolerating the, you know, the perfect frequency is eight. But if they can't tolerate, drop it down a little. That'll, that'll help out and tolerate. Even tolerate. Excellent. Good pearl. Okay. Joko, I think you had a question there. You were up. Yes. Um, thank you so much for a wonderful seminar. Uh, when you said uh, working on the flexology point, uh, ground the feet with the plate, and the work on the hands, uh, do you, so the, like a uh, positive minus, how do you place um, um, like a motor one, motor two? Could you tell me the details of how you run the currency? Yeah, and when I do the stimulation of the fingertips, you know, mm -hmm. for example, if I'm gonna do the fingertips, then I have their feet mm -hmm. on the plates. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I typically just do mode one with that. I don't think mm -hmm. there'd be anything wrong with doing mode two, and I think mm -hmm. John does that, and I've done mm -hmm. I've done it too. But sometimes mm -hmm. it's just for time purposes. I don't, mm -hmm. um, but I think it's fine to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then when then when I'm going to work on the feet, I just have a I have the grounding switch to the hands with the bars. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So a uh, both feet like a positive or uh, negative. Oh, how do you how do you hook them up? You yeah. know, I tend to just go with the with the right left. You know, I try to match that. And John, I know you can speak into that more. Yeah, with, with the foot plates, you're going to be doing a junction box, two foot plates at the bottom, and having their have their hands up, and then treat the tips of each finger like little mm -hmm. headlights, which is the brain reflexes. And mm -hmm. uh, but your common setup is uh, two foot plates into a junction box. That's your. Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter whether it's a positive or a negative. Naturally, if you're using. If you're okay. using a trigger probe, it, will, it can only be a negative import, you know, so, but they do switch back and forth from positive to negative every half a cycle. So, you, you know, but you're not given any of their choices, but that's the standard setup. Mm -hmm. you know, if you okay. want the hands, if you have them on, on the bed and have the hands on two foot plates and then treat the tips of each toe, mm -hmm. you know, again, whenever you're doing, dealing with neurological, you are just using mode one. If there's connective tissue mm -hmm. issues, that's the time when you bring in mode two. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Matt, I have a question for you regarding when you're working with um, traumatic brain injury patients and patients who are stuck and sympathetic. Yeah. How many turns and cycles do you typically see that it takes to get them to hold? Because one of the things that I've seen or have heard is that, you know, the, they'll be there for a while and then they'll backslide on you. And then you have to keep treating them in order to get them so that they learn the new patterns and hold the new patterns. Yeah. I like, um, I like it when I get patients from out of town because they, they, they commit for five to 10 days of therapy. And I find the consistency, just clinically, this clinical experience, when patients get back-to-back -back treatments for one to three hours a day, like you know that i find that tends to really make a change that can go on for weeks and months that will allow them to actually heal and recover when patients are kind of shoddy or like i, I came in i got a one or two hour treatment and i disappeared for three months that's when there's kind of like the can that you don't quite see the results you want to see so i i do see accumulate a cumulative effect with the therapy thank you that's very helpful yeah uh-huh Brock, have you worked with um, uh, Parkinson's very much with the expo? I haven't. Is that Michael? Yes, me. Hi, Matt. Uh, I got your I got your voice. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I I haven't seen a lot of Parkinson's patients. To be honest with you, with working with this, have you? Yeah, I, I've got uh, two in particular. In what you just mentioned is what stimulated this uh, question. Uh, this fella uh, has been out of work for a year, so he's one of our are quote unquote free patients and just a sweet, wonderful man. And um, he was out of work for at least a year. Um, I had him come in three times a week for the first uh, week that he'd come over. His wife is a nurse next door in another clinic. And within the first two sessions, uh, he was able to drive, which he'd not been able to drive for about eight months. And um, 
And so we just kept going and I kept adding on uh, to the uh, protocol with the minerals. His minerals were extremely deficient and started adding on the minerals, like you were saying, I don't do IVs. So we're just going up to ramping up to uh, bowel tolerance. Um, but then when I did the, uh, the spinal, uh, bilateral spinal, um, I mean, it was, it was uh, truly remarkable. It's like all the lights turned on. Um, now he's working five days a week. He's working eight to 10 hours a day. Now he asks to come in on Saturdays because he's working all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. So, yeah, yeah, very exciting. But the mineral thing, I didn't, I did not, I have not been using the folic minerals. And it seems like that's maybe a gap uh, to support the whole frequency um, introduction here. Yeah, I think I think you get better treatment if you're using uh, not only just magnesium and maybe maybe potassium, but using the fulvic minerals. It has that broad spectrum, and they're mm -hmm. liquid, and so no matter how how impaired their gut function is, it seems to absorb pretty well. Okay. Yeah. That's, you know, that's okay. the wonderful thing about the integrative approach that Matt has shown you all with the, the nutritional supplement. And what the equoscope does is the equoscope sets the body up to be the absorber. Your body either absorbs or rejects. And the device sets, sets the body up, opens all those voltage-sensitive ion channels, and you become a wonderful sponge to absorb. Whereas that's a problem with a lot of uh, chronic illnesses, the body's incapable of absorbing. Well, my gosh, Matt. Um... That, that's probably the best presentation I've seen on this topic since I've been doing this work. That was really outstanding, really good. Uh, thanks, Michael. I appreciate you, buddy. Yeah, yeah excellent. Excellent, to do. Yeah. excellent Matt. It was a great presentation. Really, the integrative approach, as I said, it's not one pill. It's not one machine. It's not one anything. It's when you combine all the wonderful things that the body needs in order to repl replicate itself perfectly and that's when you really allow the body to be the miracle uh, it was meant to be. And it's not just one thing. I look every patient in the eye and say, do you wish to be well? Yeah. Because only you can put the right things in. And having a, an integrated medical doctor that can see the lack of supplementation that you're getting and the lack of by running the blood, you know, that's the first thing that, uh, as the developer would say, did you run the blood? You've got to look at the blood. Yeah, you know, that's some just one miracle deal in How's the body be the miracle it was set up to be? You're electrical before you're biochemical all day long. Any other final questions? We're at the top of the hour. We're looking to change the face of medicine as you know it today into a non-drug and non-invasive world that has a 90 plus percent success rate in the reduction of chronic pain and disease, improve healthcare quality and lower healthcare costs. So share with your friends and let them know that there's new tools with your rules. God bless you all. Yeah, thank you, John. Thank you, thank you for helping us all thank do this. Yes, yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you very uh, much. Michael and I, the, uh, there's probably two or three dozen patients we know right now who would not be alive today if it wasn't for the echoscope because they were heading in the wrong, they were heading the only place their doctor could send them, which was hospice. That's and right. The echoscope, they, they avoided it. That's right. It's amazing. I mean, absolutely amazing. And like what Brock just did with this young lady is bring hope back to her. I mean, she was going seriously emotionally in the wrong direction. And um, the um, the fact that, that Matt prays with all of his patients, I think it's just, just beautiful and, and essential. Absolutely essential. So thanks again, Matt. It's hope with the scope. Hope with the scope, dude. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. All right. God Thank bless you. you. Good night. Good night, everybody. God bless you all.